Well, I've titled the message this morning, 5,000 Fed. Easy title for the text that we're just discussing and studying this morning. When we come to Matthew 14, we are coming to an end of what it, biblical scholars call the Great Galilee Ministry. Those same scholars say that our Lord began this ministry in Galilee at the end of A.D. 27 and continued through to A.D. 29. So that's about a two-year period that he is ministering there in the Galilee region. When we get to this point in, in our study of Matthew 14, I want you to see this. I want you to understand fully the whole concept of this. When we get to Matthew chapter 14, Jesus is only about one year away from his burial and his resurrection at Calvary. That's all he's got left. And at this important point, Jesus performs what is perhaps his most famous miracle of all, and that is the feeding of the 5,000, and that's just the men, folks. That's not counting the wives and the kids. So this morning, let's begin looking at this passage together and see what truths Christ has for you and I in this important place. First of all, Jesus gives us an example of compassion for others. I'd like you to see, and, and as you have your Bibles, and I hope and pray that you keep your Bibles open through the messages so you can look down at what the Scripture says. But I'd like you to look at verses 13 through 16. There we see a beautiful picture uh, of the compassion of Christ, and we learn that we as Christians ought to copy this kind of compassion toward others that Jesus does here. Now, before we can appreciate the whole force of this passage as a whole, we've got to understand the whole context of it. Jesus knew that he needed some rest. Jesus, yes, is God in human flesh. But he is also man. And being man, he gets tired. He gets hungry. And Jesus knew that he needed, because of this two-year extensive ministry there in Galilee, he knew he needed some rest, and he desired some, some solitude, just to get alone time. Don't we all need that at times? We think to ourselves, boy, if I could just have five minutes by myself, no phone calls, no kids, no dogs, no nothing. Wow, what five minutes would do. And beloved, Jesus was no different because he was man. And that's why he desired. He desired time to pray and to be with his heavenly father. So he withdrew from his public ministry and got into a boat with his disciples and went to the other side of the lake. Seeking, like I said, seeking some solitude. And when he got there, the crowds had already anticipated his movements. And they had made their way from the towns like Capernaum and elsewhere. And they had made their way to the seashore so, they, so that when he stepped out of the boat, there they were. Thousands upon thousands waiting for him to minister. And again, beloved, Christ was tired. He was in need of some rest. But when Jesus steps ashore, he sees the crowd and his reaction is immediate. He does three things when he sees the multitudes that Matthew teaches us. One is he teaches us he feels compassion upon the multitudes. That's what Matthew's telling us. We are told that he heals the sick. And now while Matthew doesn't tell us, but parts of 
Luke and Mark and John, they do, that he taught them. So he's not only meeting their physical needs, but he's trying to meet their spiritual needs as well and teach them. The Lord responds in, in his time of need to the needs of others. To heal their sick and to, to care for them. And we shouldn't underestimate this, this section of Scripture because it's an important one. It clearly impacted the lives of of those disciples. The disciples clearly thought that this parable was so great that all four of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all records this event in the ministry of Jesus Christ. And as Jesus gets out of the boat, like I said, he begins to minister to the people, and the disciples are practically minded come to him at the end of the day and look what they say. They're practical minded, aren't they? Look what they say to him. This place is desolate. There's nothing here. And the hour is late. And I don't know if any of them wore a sundial on their wrist, but they probably pointed to their watches. So send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus' words to them were exactly correspondent to his own compassion toward the multitudes. As Christ was showing compassion toward the multitudes, he wanted his disciples to have the same kind of compassion toward him. So Jesus' response to the crowds following him serves to impress upon his disciples the mandate for their own self-sacrificial ministry. Why did they tell him, hey, send them in the village? They had five loaves and two fish. We're not sharing our lunch. We're not going hungry. Send them away. Jesus had called his disciples to be the shepherds of the flock. And in this passage, he is giving them an example of how you shepherd a flock. This passage spoke to my heart so much this week. Because I had the privilege of shepherding this flock. I'm the under-shepherd, okay? He's the great shepherd, amen? I'm just the flunky. I'm the under-shepherd. But it spoke to my heart greatly this week. But he's given them an example of how you shepherd a flock, and the shepherd denies himself for the sake of the flock. And that's the example that he sets for for the disciples. And because Jesus knew that he was the people's shepherd and desired to care for them, he wanted his disciples to have that same kind of mentality in ministering toward the flock. And I have to say, you read First and Second Peter, you read the Gospel of, of, of uh John, and you see that these men, and you read 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and all the rest, and you see that in their lives, don't you? At first it didn't catch on, but it did later. And they were willing to sacrifice and deny their own comforts for that of the others. So Jesus heals the sick. Now listen, he heals the sick in spite of his own needs and, and their earthly materialistic motivations for following him. A lot of these people were not following Jesus because they loved him. They were not following him because they were his disciples and he was the Messiah. Why were they following him? Because he was healing their sick and feed their bellies. Now, not maybe not all of them, but there was a good number of them. 
That's why they were following. They got the word. Hey, you follow this guy. If grandma's sick, he'll heal her. If you're hungry, hang tight. He'll feed you. And he's setting out an example. Jesus is modeling perfectly self-denial for the sake of the ministry and compassion on people who are even hard in their hearts. If you read John chapter 6, John chapter 6 will give the long account of this, of this parable. But it's very clear that the people were attracted to Jesus' ability to heal. But like I said, they were not so much interested in his claims of his Messiahship. Who was not setting up an earthly kingdom as they thought as Messiah. But it was a spiritual kingdom that he was setting up. Now Jesus knew that this crowd was not necessarily following him for spiritual reason or spiritual motives. And yet, what does he do? He still opens his heart, and his heart goes out to them. He shows them compassion despite the state of their heart. And in so doing, he gives his disciples an example, and he gives us an example of how to minister to people. And you minister to people just like the minister ministers. Do you know that? You still minister to people by showing compassion toward them and care toward them. But let me ask you this morning, is that a desire in your heart to show compassion toward those who are in need, whether they follow Jesus or not? Because isn't that what Jesus did? He met the spiritual needs. He taught them. Mark, Luke, and John tells us but he also met their physical need. He gave them something to eat. And we need to do the same thing. We can feed them, but we also need to teach them. But does that mean they'll be Christians and followers of Jesus Christ? Not necessarily. But do we discard them and throw them off to the side? No. Why not? Jesus did. Number two, Jesus demonstrates that all the power of ministry comes through him, okay? We see something else in verses 16 to 20. Not only does Jesus set an example for his disciples and for you and I as Christ's disciples display compassion on people, but he also shows us and displays his divine power in an extraordinary way. And we need, as Christians, we need to appreciate God's divine power, shouldn't we? Verses 16 to 20, we have the account of Jesus calling the disciples to bring him those loaves and fishes and let him show them how he will provide for the multitudes. Now, when it says loaves, don't think of a loaf of bread. Think of something maybe a little bit bigger than a muffin. That's it. And two fish. I'm not talking about 20-pound catfish or five-pound bass. I'm talking about maybe something on the order of a perch. Now, think of that. We all know what a perch is, five of them, or two of them. And five little, bigger than a muffin, but not real big, and that's it. That's all they had. And he's going to show them, through his divine power, how he's going to feed these people with just that. 
And there are several lessons that the disciples need to learn in this command when Jesus said to them, you remember he said, they said, hey, send them away, send them away. And what did he say to them? You feed them. There are several lessons that the disciples needed to learn in that command he, he gave to them. When he said that, you give them something to eat. Here's what he was doing. Lesson number one. Jesus is teaching them is the, the responsibility to minister. Okay? He's teaching them, you have the responsibility, disciples. I could do this, but I sh shouldn't do this. So I'm going to do it in a generic way, not to embarrass anybody. Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? I don't want to embarrass anybody, so I'm not going to say, say amen or raise your hand. If you've accepted Christ, you are. Then, beloved, listen. It is your responsibility, just as it was Peter, James, and John, and all the rest of the guys, to minister. Now I'm going to say it. Amen? That's right. That's right. It's our responsibility, every single Christian. It's our responsibility to minister to the needs of others. Number two, he's teaching them by giving them this command, you give them something to eat. He's teaching them that really it's him who's going to do it through his divine power. Okay? Jesus looks out on this crowd and he sees 5,000 men, not counting the women and the kids, and he sees these five little muffins and two little perches, he's smart enough to know that realistically, humanly, it won't feed them. But through his divine power, he's going to show them that he can do it, even though it's their responsibility to minister. And that's what the disciples needed to learn. They needed to learn that. They needed to know and we need to know that they do not have and we do not have the ability to minister to anyone because that ability, that power, that source, that strength is only found in Jesus Christ. If you're ministering to people in your own power, then you're doing it wrong. If you're ministering to people through the power of Jesus Christ and where he gets all the honor and he gets all the glory, then that's what it's all about. And when Jesus says to the disciples, you feed them, he knows that it's going to drive the disciples and hopefully it will drive us to our knees and drive us to our faces in dependence on Jesus Christ. Because these guys, these 12 guys called the disciples, they don't have a clue of how they're going to do this. I can imagine in my mind's eye that some of those disciples were spitting and sputtering. But, 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 but Jesus, we've got, and there's all those. How are we going to do it? And what does Jesus say? Bring them to me. And I don't know if it's Peter, but I'm sure some of them, they didn't have a clue of how Jesus was going to do it. Because they're not totally sanctified. Okay? And no matter how many miracles that these disciples see Jesus perform, they still didn't realize it. So by telling the disciples to give the crowd something to eat, Jesus is not only stressing the responsibility for compassion, but he is reminding them of the true source of the ability to minister. 
and they will never be able to discharge the command that Christ has given them in their own strength. Only Christ can do that. That what he told them to do. And that's how it is in all ministry. When we as a church reach out and we help other people in need, we're not doing it in our own strength. We're doing it in the power of Jesus Christ. Amen? And that's what it ought to be all about. It's doing it in His name, for His glory, for His honor. Whether Grace Baptist Church gets recognized or not, whether you or I get recognized or not, we're doing it because Jesus has commanded us to do it, but we're doing it through Him. And beloved, when the disciples get to the point and they understand that it's through Him that they're doing this and that it's being done, and when we understand that, we're at a point where you feel you're outmatched in ministry and you think, Lord, there's no way that I can help these people. Lord, there's no way I can help this group of people. You're right where God wants you to minister because all true Christian ministry is beyond our own personal resources. All true Christian ministry is prayerfully dependent upon Christ and totally dependent upon the power of the Holy Spirit to do the work. Because we can't heal wounded hearts, can we? As much as we want to, we cannot bind up the brokenhearted and raise the dead as much as we might want. Only Christ can do that, beloved. Only Christ can. So when Christ calls us to minister in passion to others, he's not saying, if I want to figure out how, he's not saying, if, if I want you to figure out how to get this done. Rather, he's saying, I want you to be so reliant upon me that you trembly go forth knowing that you are totally overmatched, but I'm not. And that's the way we've got to think. So we minister only in the Lord's divine power. Third, Christ only can meet what is called the soul needs of people. Jesus is the source of life. You'll see that in verses 19 to 21. Christ is pictured in this passage as the only one who is truly able to meet all the needs of people. Yours, mine, are the lost. In this passage, we learn that Christ is able to meet all the needs, even in this group of feeding the 5,000. Christ is showing his disciples that he alone is able to supply all our needs, both materialistic and spiritual. In fact, this is the third lesson that he's teaching. You'll recall that I said that when Jesus said, you feed them, he was teaching them three lessons. You remember me saying that? The first one was their responsibility to have compassion upon others. The second was the disciples didn't have the power in themselves to do the ministry, that only they can do it through Jesus Christ. The third lesson they are to learn is that Jesus himself is the source of life. He is the one who, who has what they need. You don't have what they need. I don't have what they need. Only Jesus has what they need. Through my 13 years of being the pastor here at Grace Baptist. There have been many times where you are kind enough, and I say this seriously, <coughs> that you are kind enough to invite me into your lives 
and tell me what's going on. And there are so many times, I have to tell you, when you share with me these, these things, there are many times when I wish on the human side of me. I wish that I could wave a magic wand of some sort and help you. Okay? That I love you enough that I wish that I, I had it within me to straighten out the power or the problem in your life and, and, and so you would be happy and have joy in your life and not have this burden or pressure on you. But I don't. I don't have the answer. But I can tell you this. And I say this to different ones of you at different times. He does. He does. All I can give you is what he gives into my hands. But he is the source. He is the answer to any of your concerns, any of your heartaches, any of your sorrows, any troubles that come your way. Beloved, He is the source. I can pray with you. I can pray for you, and believe me, I do. But I want you to know He is the source. This is what Christ wanted his disciples, Peter, James, and John, to realize and to see. Have compassion, disciples, yes. But know in your hearts and in your mind that, that it's, you're helping and you're showing compassion, not because of who you are, but because who you are in me. And it's all me, Jesus is saying. And only I can do it. That's what he's saying. Now how did I learn it? I learned it from reading the scriptures. Seeing it in the lives of other people. Godly men that I've been fortunate and blessed to be around and see them minister to the needs of people and say, I don't know how we're going to do it. Only God does. So let me close with this this morning. I want to say in closing that this, all, this, this miracle that we read in John 14, it also points to Christ's fulfillment of the Old Testament. <clears throat> Think of this. God, through Moses, had provided manna to the children of Israel in the wilderness. Moses knew he didn't do it. He had to show compassion to the Israelites. But he didn't know how to do it. He didn't know where it was come from. And when it did happen, he knew it was only from God. God, through Elijah, provided a continuous supply of flour and oil for, you remember the widow lady who was in need? Do you think if you could ask Elijah, hey, Elijah, that was great what you did. Elijah would not have tucked on his, his lapels and said, yes, I did a good job, didn't I? You remember that. Remember my name. No. He would have said, listen, I was commanded to show compassion on that widow woman. But it was all God. Do you really think I knew where that flour and oil was going to come from? Mm -mm. Didn't have a clue. All I know is that my God is big and he can do it. Then there's Elisha. God through Elisha fed 100 men with only, think of this, 100 men. And Elisha fed these 100 men with only 20 
barley loaves of bread. Think of that. 100 men over here, 20 loaves of barley bread over here. In some circles, that would get to about the first 10 men. And I believe Elisha would have said, it wasn't me, it was God. It was through his divine power, all I had was the loaves. And through him, and him showing me that I had to have compassion on those 100 guys, he did it. And God, through his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, feeds 5,000 men. That's not counting the women and children that were there. That's thousands upon thousands, isn't it? Five little muffins and two perch. It doesn't record for us, but can't you just imagine Peter talking to James and John because, you know, they're kind of the inner guys after it was all done and they picked up those 12 baskets full. And, and, and it said, we read earlier, it said that they were all satisfied. And I know some people are satisfied after they eat more than others. Okay? But I can imagine Peter looking at James and John going, I can't believe this. We fed. And I think that's what he would have said. We fed. And I think John the Beloved would have said, No, Peter. Jesus fed. 5,000 men, not counting the women and children. And we've got 12 baskets full of leftovers. And I'm sure Peter stopped. It doesn't tell us. I'm just throwing this in. Pastor's right, okay? Pastor's privilege. And Peter said, this is a God thing. Because I'll tell you what, James and John, I didn't know how we was going to do it. And I really didn't know how Jesus was going to do it. But he did it. Beloved, the Lord is showing you and I this morning the sufficiency of Jesus Christ to meet all your needs, all my needs. The only thing The only thing standing between you and I in his filling our needs is our willingness to admit we have a need. We're Americans. We can do it ourselves. We don't need anybody else. Right? No. We need to admit we have needs. And guys, I'm going to say this to you. Love y'all. But sometimes we need to admit we have needs and we don't know how it's going to happen. We need to admit as people that we have needs. But too many times we're proudful and we don't want to admit that we have those needs or that we need anybody's help. We don't even want to admit that we're sinners. I said that to a guy one day. I said, you know, the scripture says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And he said, whoa, wait a minute. And he just eyebrows kind of frowned, rolled, and he said, are you saying that I'm a sinner? And I said, I'm saying you're a sinner, I'm a sinner. Well, I don't like that. That doesn't make me feel good. It 
doesn't matter. Right? Doesn't matter. That's what God says. God says we're all sinners. And we, not only that, but we've offended him. And sometimes we've offended others. And Christ reaches out and he says, I can meet those needs. I can meet those needs. So let me ask you this morning. What's stopping you? What obstacle is in your heart this morning from receiving provisions that Christ says that he has for you? Now, I'm not claiming a blab it and grab it, name it and claim it guy. You know me better than that. But listen, God wants to bless us. And God can meet your needs if you will admit to him that you have a need and you can't do it. Is it our pride? Is it the consequences of confessing sin, which, in, which is between you, our God, and are you and others? Is that what's keeping you from being blessed by God? My prayer this morning is that God would break down the walls of any of us of hard-heartedness and that he would draw us to himself who feeds us eternally, spiritually. And listen, if you're, if you're a believer and you're weak and you're doubting, I pray that we would see, you would see again in this historical account the amazing way that the Savior is able to provide for every need that these people had, both physically and spiritually. He can fill it. And not only can he fill it, but there'll be stuff left over. We just need to admit to him that we need him. And that we're not as great as we think we are. Let's pray. Our Father, we ask this morning that you would break down the walls, the doors of our heart, and that you would come in and draw us to Christ the Savior, and that we would trust on him, that we would receive him alone, and not with mere words of our lips, but that we would receive him with our hearts and our lives and that we would eat and with fellowship, that we would feast with him both now and forevermore, that we would ask of him and admit to him that we have needs and we don't understand how. And maybe our spouses don't understand how, but you do and that we trust in you. Father, speak to our hearts, I pray today. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. And amen. Well, let's stand together and take your hymnal. Turn to 290 and let's sing, I am thine own Lord's. And let's sing it as a prayer, okay? Let's sing it as a prayer to Him. Let's mean it in our hearts. I am Thine, O Lord. So many times, like I've said this to you before, so many times when we come to the close, we think it's for people to be saved. True. But it is also for you and I as Christians to drive home the fact that we need to walk with Him and be obedient to Him. And sometimes in our hurdly world, we start thinking of who we are and what we've accomplished. And beloved, we haven't accomplished anything in life but to mess it up a lot of times. 
But even after being saved, we need to say, I'm thine, O oh Lord. Use me. Do whatever you want with me. Help me to follow you. Let's sing.